Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the video teaching series, Houses of Worship, or what role did houses and homes play in the ministry and the life and the function and the purpose of the New Testament church in the Bible? And that's a very, very important subject. And as I am teaching this series, the uh, coronavirus is just beginning to really intensify in this country, and public gatherings are being shut down in versus various states. Some have already shut down churches. Others are su suggesting that they consider not having services for the next few weeks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are churches that are not going to be able to function because their whole focus is their facility, because they don't have this revelation, they haven't looked, they haven't seen. And I'm not talking about a specific expression of ministry that takes place in homes. It's just that the New Testament church didn't just meet publicly daily, but they met from house to house. That's who, That was the New Testament church. And so for so many churches, we don't have that element of ministry as a part of the body of Christ. We don't have that, whatever that is, whatever that is. And so that's what the, that's the focus of this series that we're teaching. And so uh, we're, we're looking at houses and their role in notable events in the New Testament and what that means for us. And so this lesson, uh, we want to look at one of the most uh, famous events in the in the Gospels, the Last Supper. And it may be shocking to you to consciously acknowledge, well, wait a minute, the Last Supper took place in a house, not in a church, not in a church family life center, not in a church fellowship hall, not in a church sanctuary. It took place in a house. With the facts and points presented so far in this uh, series of teachings as the foundation for this study, let's proceed. The Last Supper was celebrated in the upper room of a house. While the following scripture context, scriptural context from the Gospels is not actually in the New Testament, which we'll discuss in a minute, it is most relevant to the beginning of the New Testament as we will observe during the first portion of this study. So let's read a little bit about this. There's a cu couple of different scriptures I'm going to read on this, or a text of scripture. Ma Mark chapter 14, verse 12. And the first day of the un of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, Passover lamb, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou uh, that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there ye shall meet a man bearing a pitcher of water, follow him. Why is that unusual? Because usually women bore the pitchers of water. And I don't want to get into that, but that's the way it was. So it wasn't going to be, what about, which one of all these men bearing these pitchers of water? No. A man bearing a pitcher of water would have been notable enough that when they saw a man bearing a pitcher of water, they would know who to follow. And wherefore, and wheresoever he shall go in, say ye, ye to the good man of the house. Now, it didn't say the man bearing the water was the good man of the house, but that man going into that house identified the house and say to the good man of the house, that is the man who is the owner of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber where I'm, I, I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there. Make ready for us. And his disciples went forth, came in the city, and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. So they went to the city, and guess what? Exactly what he said it's what happened. They saw a man bearing a pitcher of water. They followed him. He goes to the house. They figuratively knock on the door, and they address the good man of the house. The master wants to know where do you have prepared for us to for him to eat the Passover. And there was a large upper room already prepared waiting. 
That's all amazing and miraculous and supernatural, isn't it? That just really is. It's awesome. Okay, now in Luke, in Luke, it says it this way, Luke 22 and verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed, and he sent Peter and John. So in Mark, we don't know who they were, but in, in Luke, we do. Peter and John saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you, and he shall show you. The Lord's telling them this in advance. A large upper room furnished there, make ready. And they went forth and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Notice, please, again, the upper room was furnished and prepared in advance. For the master, uh, the upper room furnished prepared for the master was a room on an upstairs floor, according to Strong's, of a man's house. So, the, 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 this famous, notable, spiritually greatly significant event, the, what we call the Last Supper, that event took place not in the temple, not in some holy place, as we would call it, but in a man's house. It wasn't even Jesus' house. It wasn't even in any of the disciples' house. They, according to what the Scripture is saying here, they didn't even know this man. The disciples that were sent didn't know this man. But he didn't even argue. It was already waiting. And that's what they did. Uh, again, this house was someone's residence. It was a, wasn't a meeting hall he was renting. The Lord's communication with the disciples implies that they did not know, again, they did not know the good man before this point in time. Also, given the former occupations of the 12 disciples, it is highly unlikely that this house, as described, could have belonged to any of them. The man bearing the pitcher of water was evidently a servant and the good man a wealthy householder, according to Strong's. The word good man in the house was a householder whose house was large and well-staffed. But my point here is this. It was, this was the site of this very spiritually significant event. We would have thought, oh, this needs to be take this needs to take place in the temple. I mean, at least in the outer court where he usually taught, preached, and healed people. Or maybe they could have gotten their way somehow into the holy place to have done this. Ooh, maybe because he is God manifested in the flesh, they could have risked going into the holiest of all for the for an event like this. No. No. This happened in a house. In a house. Huh. Well, if, we, if they'd have just had a nice church building, it would have happened there. I don't think so. I don't think so. The Lord's trying to make a point here. That he can do even the most significant spiritual things in houses as we will see in these lessons as we go through them. Some of the most spiritually significant events in all of the Bible, and especially the New Testament, took place in the house. I wonder if there's any possibility the Holy Ghost can do certain things like that in our church. Oh, that's right. Uh, I, we don't do stuff in houses, do we? I'm not being sarcastic. 
I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to get your attention. Now, I said earlier that I would discuss why this was not the New Testament. And this is not an off-the-point point. This is the point. The reason for clarifying in the preface to the above scriptures that the Last Supper scene is not recorded in the New Testament writings is because the event did not take place during the actual New Testament era. Oh, that's not true. It was in the Gospels. Well, let's find out. Let's let the Bible tell us when the New Testament began. As recorded in Hebrews, Paul definitively defined the time frame of the New Testament. Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. These are the words of the Holy Ghost of the Apostle Paul in Hebrews. What does that mean? That means that Jesus died at the end of Matthew. He died at the end of Mark. He died at the end of Luke. He died at the end of John, which means those books cannot be New Testament books. And as I said in a previous lesson, the word church isn't even used in the four Gospels but twice, both times in Matthew, once in six, Matthew 16, once in Matthew 18, both times with future tense verbs. So the church, its structure, the New Testament plan of salvation, none of those things are truly revealed in the four Gospels. The four Gospels is how the testator lived and died to provide us salvation. Now, uh, we, we... not too long ago, there was a lady in our church who worked in home health care, and she had been taking care of this gentleman who was in his 80s, who was a uh, uh, former uh, Marine in World War II. He had no family. He had no relatives, and she did not know it, but when he died, he left everything he had to her. It wasn't a huge amount, but it, was, it wasn't a small amount either. House, all assets, everything, left it all to her. Well, if he would have told her, which he didn't in advance, I don't believe, uh, as far as the way I understand the story, if he told her in advance, she couldn't have gone in there and demanded, give me the house now. No, she couldn't have. It wasn't hers till the testator was dead. Therefore, It is being a thief and a robber to try to appropriate New Testament plan of salvation in a way that was practiced before the death of the testator. Because the testator not only provided the price that was paid to purchase our inheritance for us, he also Uh, provided the means whereby we could receive our inheritance. Repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins, and we receive the Holy Ghost. And Paul said in Ephesians 1 that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the earnest of our inheritance. So, even though man has designated the four Gospels as New Testament books, God has not done so. God didn't do so. According to these very clear, very clear verses, the New Testament could not begin until after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the testator. 
He's not only the mediator between God and man. He's not only the mediator that brings us from one testament to the the Old Testament to the New. He is all that also the testator who gives his life that we might inherit the new. As we all know, none of this happened until the end of the Gospels, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Gospel, did not happen until the end of the Gospels, the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Furthermore, the single most significant promise of the New Testament was mankind receiving the promise of the Father, which is the indwelling of the uh, or the infilling of the Spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Any as any observant Bible student knows, this outpouring uh, was recorded in, in recorded in Acts chapter two, verses one through four, did not take place until the day of Pentecost thus making Acts the first book of the New Testament. In light of these biblical facts, the Last Supper could not have taken place during the time of the New Testament. So the point I'm making here is, when we get into the next lesson or so, you'll see why I'm going to all of this trouble right here. Because of future events that happen in that exact upper room and their significance to the New Testament. But also, it is just like everything else is previewed in the Gospels that is going to be fulfilled in uh, the book of Acts and as defined in the and described in, and taught in the epistles. Uh, so it is that the, the role of houses was critical. Now we know in Jesus' travels, he frequently slept out under the stars with the group, the large group that traveled with him. But we also have numerous times when he did significant ministry in people's houses, such as Jesus being inside the house that was full of people and they had to tear the roof off to get the lame man down through the hole in the roof where Jesus could minister to him in the house. Uh, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, uh, Jesus went home with him to minister to him. He didn't minister him out in public. And he said, this day is salvation come to this house. And we could go on and on of all these different situations. Uh, Look at the ministry that took place in Mary and Martha's house, some of the most significant verses ever spoken in Scripture in, at the end of Luke chapter 10. We could go on and on. I'm not going to. But there are so many events that happened in the life of Jesus inside houses. We, we note what happened and we pay attention to what took place, but we forget the context. It wasn't in the temple. It wasn't in the temple. Now, there were some things that happened in the temple, and there's things that happened in the synagogue. His very first sermon, his very first preaching, speaking, happened in a synagogue in his hometown in Luke chapter 4. So it's not that he never ministered publicly. We know he did. But we also know that Jesus personally ministered in Houses and significant events took place in those houses. And if that is a precursor of the New Testament church, and if he taught the disciples, the apostles, and commanded us to them to teach us, Matthew 28, 20, then we have to pay attention to this factor. Jesus never intended for his ministry or the ministry of the church, his body, to be limited by a specific facility. He never intended to do that. That was never his purpose. It was never his goal. It wasn't. It wasn't. And yet, that's what we do in so many situations today. So, my friend, I pray that the Spirit of the Lord, after after these lessons, just these lessons so far, would give you the grace to persevere through 
this series and let the Holy Ghost speak to you. Open your mind and free the church from the confines of that single address where we believe everything has to happen there. I've said this many times. One miracle on the street, one miracle in a hospital room, one miracle in somebody's home, a sinner's house is worth a thousand miracles inside a church building. Why? Because ministry is to the world. And not one time did he tell us to invite the world to our place of worship so they could be ministered to. He commanded the church to go into the world. There's only even one scripture in the Bible that would lead to the conclusion that there is any instruction of sinners being present when the church gathered. That would be 1 Corinthians 14 when Paul made the differentiation on speak the gift of tongues and its usage versus prophecy, gift of tongues coupled with interpretation versus prophecy. And he said that the reason for the gift of tongues manifesting before the interpretation, which is equivalent to prophecy, uh, is that the tongues go as a sign to the unbeliever present among you that what's about to be spoken is from God. That's the only verse I can find in the Bible that actually discusses the potential of sinners being present, non-believers, unsaved people being present when the church gathered. Why? Because the church is supposed to come together. We're supposed to come together for prayer, for instruction, for direction, for correction, for fellowship, et cetera, et cetera. But we come together for all of those things to be sent out into the world for ministry. That's Bible. Is it wrong? Am I saying it's wrong? It's sin to invite somebody to church so they can get saved. No. But when they don't come, what do we do? Well, they don't want what we've got. No. God's not obligated to bless us doing it our way. We're supposed to take the gospel to them, not require them to come to us. Why do we do it like that? It's safer for us, safer for us. It's a way for us to hide and to avoid persecution if possible. We can hide out here and people don't know what we do and what we say. And Now, a lot of churches are streaming now, so... That comfort zone is gone. Isn't it amazing how much more careful people are when they uh, <laughs> know that what they're saying is being streamed versus when it's not being streamed? That's, isn't that amazing? So public access church services is not synonymous with public gatherings of the church. Not synonymous. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you and I would open our minds, hearts, souls, spirits to the revelation of the Spirit of God, of the Word of God, uh, or the revelation by the Spirit of God, or the Word of God, of these principles for the sake of this world and for sake of the lost and for the sake of our own souls. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.